The capstone project for module two requires you to revise a paper which you've written or contributed to in the past. You can use a paper that comes from another course at Northeastern. You could use a paper that comes from another course at a different school. You could use something that you wrote for co-op as well. The only thing I would say about using material from co-op is to make sure that you've got the legal rights to that material and that the company that you worked for is okay with you continuing that work outside of the workplace. I think for the purposes of our course here, since it's not something you're actually trying to publish, I don't think it will be that big of a deal. But I know some of you work with, you know, folks who have military contracts and um, work with uh, information that is, you know, classified. And in that case, you wouldn't want to be bringing that into the public eye, whether it's in our class or elsewhere. But that said, there's two things that you've got to do in order to have a successful revision of this paper before you really get to necessarily the writing of the paper. And that's finding a call for papers and then from there engaging in some new research. Uh, this tutorial here is going to cover how to find a call for papers, which is actually quite easy, um, as well as give you some advanced research tips that if you haven't already encountered these concepts, that will be very helpful in finding material for your revision. Let's start by talking about calls. What are calls? The currency of academia is papers. That doesn't necessarily mean that academics are pumping out a new paper every couple of weeks and uh, publishing those papers easily and, and receiving, you know, a windfall of residuals from that publication process. Rather, this is something where uh, many academics probably have a, a few hits that they lean on and try to widely publicize in order to attract more attention to their name, their work, what it is that they're trying to do. The way that these calls work is, let's say I'm publishing an academic journal and I need papers for an upcoming issue on a particular topic. Then I would publicize on my own website and then through aggregators and also through uh, uh, college and university communications uh, avenues that I am calling for papers. And I'll say what kinds of papers that I want. I'll probably restrict the topics to some degree um, and I'll probably uh, uh, restrict what kinds of specific research or discussion I'm interested in. Once I get all of these papers, probably myself and a number of other editors will read through them, figure out which ones will be the best fit for the journal, and uh, edit and trim those to work with the space available for the current issue of the journal. And the journal gets published with all the different papers in it, and those are the things that you read via the databases at Northeastern, which is something that we're going to spend some time talking about a little later in this tutorial. The other option is to prepare your paper for presentation at conferences. And this I think is more common than getting your work published in print. This is how you enable yourself to reuse one or two or three papers, probably works that you've been uh, uh, creating and putting together and finalizing for a number of months, if not years, uh, but how to make them uh, versatile for you. Um, there might not be that many print publication uh, options, but uh, conferences are happening all the time. They're usually held by colleges or universities or by organizations affiliated with colleges and universities. Sometimes they're held just in a business context by businesses who are looking for interesting ideas or to advance the conversation on their particular uh, field of interest. So the first thing you've got to do for this assignment is find a relevant call for papers for your work. Essentially what that means is you're gonna look for a journal or a conference that seems to be interested in what it is you're working on. And then you're going to gear your revision of your paper toward that audience. So here I've got open a website called the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And I found this website very quickly just by Googling call for papers engineering 
this looks like a uh, uh, an organization that works as an aggregator. Uh, one of the things that it is aggregating here is calls for papers. You'll notice that the table here is broken down into the journal special issue section, which is where the different calls are listed and the links to the information associated with those calls rest. And then there's a deadline section to the right. Now, obviously, if we were actually trying to get these papers published, the deadline part would be crucial, right? And many of these we would not be able to respond to because the deadlines have already passed. But we're gonna ignore that for the purposes of our assignment here. If, you, if what works best for you in writing is to use a call for papers that's dated, that the, the conference has already come and gone, the deadline has passed, that's fine. This is about getting the experience of producing a good paper. Now, if you wanna choose one where the deadline seems to work with the time frame of our class and you really wanna to try to send it out and get a spot at a conference or in a journal, by all means, go for it. I think you all are at a point in your academic career where you should be thinking about these kinds of things. And one of the things that you might be considering here um, is whether or not this is the kind of work that you might want to spend the rest of your life doing, as many people in your fields do. So let's take a look through some of these different calls here to get a feel for how they work. Okay, so we're gonna uh, focus on this one right here, special issue on quantum engineering for autonomous vehicles. So this is the Journal of Autonomous Vehicles and Systems. So if you are a person who's ever done any research that you think might be relevant to say self-driving cars or autonomous weapon systems for the military, this might be a good call for you. So let's take a look. Here you can see that the call is somewhat branded right um, it also gives you a style guide as well we'll take a look at that in a moment um, you can also link out to the journal itself which is probably the best place to start by just looking at what the journal is reading the description of the journal and then probably looking through some of the older uh, uh, editions of the journal to help you figure out if you're in the right place for now, we're gonna focus just on the call right here. Um, it says, the goal of this special issue is to publish the latest research and advances at the interface of quantum technologies and autonomous vehicles. Applications of quantum technologies have shown the greatest potential in advancement of engineering systems in recent decades, including their computational speed up and guaranteed security by integrating the unmatched possibilities of quantum advantage with engineering applications, such integrated quantum and engineering systems and technologies can potentially push the current engineering boundaries beyond any classical technique. So here you've got just in one paragraph, a kind of a good set of information by which to figure out if this is an opportunity that's going to work for you, right? You need to have some knowledge about autonomous vehicle and autonomous vehicle engineering, but you've also got to have some knowledge of quantum engineering as well. And it seems like probably computer engineering to some degree. One way that you could approach this is to say, well, you know, I've done work on self-driving cars, but I don't know that much about quantum engineering. So I'm gonna look for something that fits better. And that's a fine thing to do. However, you could also use this as an opportunity to learn about quantum engineering. You would have to do so autodidactically through research, but if you're already kind of familiar with uh, uh, what quantum engineering is, um, and, and how it relates to the topic at hand, that's probably all you need at this point, given the experience that you have from your coursework and your co-ops. So once you make your decision after reading the description about whether or not this is a good call for you, then you wanna look at the further information that they provide because it's gonna make clear uh, whether or not you're you know, onto something with that assessment. So topic areas included but not limited to applications of quantum computing, quantum AI, quantum annealing, which I don't even know what that is, quantum games, quantum communication, cryptography, teleportation, network and distributing sensing. 
Looking at calls like this is also a great way to reinvigorate your relationship with your field. You've probably been taking coursework that's a little more broad and basic during your undergraduate studies, but here, I mean, they're open to even conversation about teleportation, which is frankly kind of exciting that we're thinking about things like this in a serious academic context. So again, this is a good way to just kind of say, well, what are people in my field doing? And even if I'm not interested in writing papers about the things that I've been doing for the last three or four years, maybe there's people who are talking about something out there that I absolutely would be interested in studying this way. And that's worth thinking about. You've also got your deadlines here, when you have to have your papers in, when they'll be reviewed, and then what the publication date for the issue will be. And you've got some submission instructions here too, which if we were submitting would be very, very important for us to look at. Um, usually you are using some kind of web tool to submit your paper. Um, and the instructions here are pretty straightforward, so we're not going to go through that part of things. But I do think it's worth looking at who the guest editors are for this particular uh, uh, edition of this journal that you're going to send your paper to. The reason why I think that that's important is because it can give you some idea about, again, how to gear your work before you begin revising, before you begin even thinking about how am I going to approach this revision. It can give you a better idea of who your audience is. Um, whatever these folks are interested in, whatever they're working on, whatever seems most useful to them, I mean, that's what you want to try to do because you're trying to enter into a conversation that's already happening. So you've got to show them, hey, I have a grasp on what the conversation is and I understand how to, how to contribute to it in a meaningful way. And that's a call for papers for a journal. It's really not too difficult. I think you all would probably have an easier time parsing this call for papers than I would because it's in the language of your field. Now, one thing we wanna make sure we do is look at their uh, style guide. So here, like it says, designed to help you succeed. We're not gonna look through the whole thing here, um, but it does give you some guidelines and some things that you'll want to um, uh, adhere to as you're, uh, when you get to the end of your writing process as you start to format your work. Here they try to sell you a little bit on the process too. You know, you're going to get a good peer review from this. It's going to get published quickly. And your, um, your work here is, is going to be uh, featured under these different common research tools that academics use. And it's worth noting too that this is not the specific journal giving you these guidelines. This is the ASME who's giving you these guidelines. So you might want to check with the journal as well and see if the journal has any kind of specifications for how they would like the work to be presented. Um, namely, you would want to figure out do they require an abstract? We will for this assignment. Do they require you to use a certain citation system? And if so, which citation system should you use? For my money, I think most of you would be using IEEE, which originates from this Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. This is what um, a lot of technical science uh, uh, organizations use for their, their formatting, their citation system. There are different citation systems for different fields. I work in the ELA field, so generally we use MLA. You've probably been taught to use MLA in the past, but that doesn't mean that MLA is going to work for you if you wanna publish a paper that's outside of ELA and the humanities. They also give you some ideas for different kinds of papers that you can write. So again, this is a great thing to do before you start to write or rewrite your paper is to figure out, hey, what kind of a paper is this? Is it a research paper? Is it a technical brief? Is it a review article? Is it an expert view? I don't know if we can get away with expert views yet, but who knows? Uh, maybe if you do a good enough job of building your ethos in the paper, um, your, your peers will see you as someone with a high level of expertise, despite the fact that you're still finishing up your undergrad degree here. Probably the part you would want to pay the most attention to here is the guidelines for submitting a good manuscript. 
Now, even in your manuscripts here, this is why we're trying to think of these papers that we're writing as multimodal because uh, people are going to be viewing this stuff on the web. And so uh, thinking about SEO when you're writing an academic paper might seem counterintuitive, but uh, it's actually quite important in getting your work found and, and your ability to be uh, uh, visible to people searching through search engines starts with how you write the paper. Um, mostly the use of keywords and making sure that you're making clear to your audience what those keywords are and being consistent about using them over and over again. You've probably been taught that repetition is not necessarily a good thing and that you should not be repeating language in your writing. And that would make a lot of sense if you were writing, let's say, a, a literary nonfiction essay or a fictional short story, um, something like that. But here in academic writing, the use and reuse of keywords is critical, not just to keeping the ideas in the paper uh, uh, cohesive to your audience, but helping people seek out and find your work. Now, again, the journal will give you instructions. You want to look at those too. And you want to make sure that if you're really trying to publish these things, if anything you're dealing with is copywritten or, or uh, uh, that you do not have access or permission to reuse, that you do get permission to reuse that material. Elements of a well-prepared paper is probably another important section. You want to make sure you title your paper, that you make it clear who you are and where you're from. You want to deliver an abstract you want to make sure that you're numbering your pages. If you're using technical terms or phraseology, and you want to make sure that you're defining them, use the first person. So here's the thing. They say it should avoid personal bias. I think that's silly. Um, we all have biases. When we write, we express our biases. There's been no piece of writing ever created that did not contain some kind of inherent authorial bias. And when you were young, you were probably discouraged from using the first person pronoun uh, or pronoun set in papers like this. Um, but you absolutely should because you are speaking about your work and you can't speak about your work without using the first person set of pronouns. And you will see when you read these other papers that you're reading, these writers aren't bending over backwards to exclude themselves from their own work either. So use the first person pronoun, but you probably want to avoid things like, you know, it's my opinion that, or I think that, or I believe that. There's probably other ways that you can voice that perspective without positioning it as an opinion to your audience. Number four might seem really counterintuitive. All papers should be concise regardless of length. Concision doesn't necessarily have to do with length. Length meaning like your word count in the paper. Um, a, a paper that is 2,500 words long could be significantly less concise than a paper that is 25,000 words long because concision is economy of language. So at some point, in this process, you're going to have to carve out some time to just do an edit of your paper that is predicated on removing as much extraneous language as possible. I do this with my short stories. If I have a story that is 8,000 words long, then I will at some point decide I'm going to edit that story and try to get it down to about 6,000 words. And at first, it seems like it will be impossible. But the second that you start to, to really be conscious of, well, is this word necessary? Can I use a different uh, phrase here that's three words long instead of one that's seven words long? There are always opportunities to edit your work for concision. And in this particular uh, uh, type of or genre of paper, that's critically important. They tell you to avoid long quotations. You're not writing literature papers, so you're not, you know, extracting whole passages and then analyzing them. So that should be easy. Um, you also don't want to pad your paper with too many visuals, although you definitely want to use them. 
And then this last one, nine, is something that I see folks fumble on sometimes. Spell out acronyms on first use in the abstract in the text of the paper. Put the acronym in parentheses immediately after the spelled out term. So we're dealing with an acronym up here, right? ASME. So the first time that we were to uh, uh, necessarily list ASME, if we're going to include it in the paper, we would say the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and then in parentheses ASME. Uh, body of the paper shouldn't just be a block of text. It shouldn't just be divided down into paragraphs. The paragraphs don't all need to be uniform length. They should vary based on what your purposes in that paragraph are. But you can also divide the paper up into sections with headings and subheadings. And that is absolutely the way to go because it allows somebody to get kind of a quick uh, ascertainment of what it is you're doing in the paper without reading the whole thing in detail. Like when we talk about Harris, we talk about acknowledgments, making sure that you're acknowledging your influences. If other people helped you with the research that originated this revision of the paper, you want to make sure that you take a moment somewhere in the paper to acknowledge their work, probably between the introduction and when you start the body of the paper. Um, you're not being funded. If you were, you would want to make that clear. And then here, references within the text. References should be cited in numerical order according to order of appearance. The number of reference citations within a text should be enclosed in brackets. And ASME primarily uses the Chicago Manual of Style. So they don't allow references to Wikipedia, which I think is short-sighted. Um, but that's important to note that they aren't looking for papers that are IEEE, that they want you to use the Chicago Manual of Style. They also give you this handy checklist here um, that you can go through before you decide to submit your paper. I'm not necessarily going to say that you have to do this uh, before you turn in your paper for our course. Um, but if you were to actually be sending your paper out, this is definitely something that you would want to do. Go through this checklist and make sure you've got all your ducks in a row. What you would want to make sure is if you were doing something outside of the ASME, which I would encourage you to look at a, a large uh, swath and variety of different calls for papers from different journals and organizations. Um, if you were doing that, you would just want to make sure that you do the work that we've done here, but for that particular journal or overseeing body that publishes the journal. So that's one approach. Look for a journal that you think might be good for publishing your work. Another is to look at conferences that could feature your work. So here we have this 2024 IEEE International Conference on Robotics and Automation, which is shortened to the ICRA 2024. Um, and one of the really cool things about this one is that it's being hosted in Yokohama, Japan. So um, this is the great thing about conferences. Uh, if you've wanted to travel, if you haven't been able to travel um, and you get accepted to one of these conferences and you are, you know, representing a certain school or college or university or um, even maybe a business that you work for or co-op for, wherever you can get the funding from, there's funding available to send you to Japan to present your work. And I mean, that's such a great opportunity, right? So here it doesn't necessarily uh, have a clear call for papers, but they have this paper submission section, which is call for contributors. And it's not really that much different from looking at a journal submission guideline with the biggest caveat being that you are preparing something maybe a little bit different. So here they have a lot of different kinds of papers that uh, or, or projects that you can submit. Most of them still ask you for a traditional paper. And the idea is that while you're submitting a paper and that paper will be published with the, the other uh, papers that get accepted to the conference, you also will prepare some kind of presentation of the paper. So uh, probably what they're looking for in these uh, uh, video submissions here is something of what your presentation will be. Do you want to give a solo talk? Do you want to participate in a panel talk? Do you want to do a table exhibit? That's really common. It's like a science fair for adults. You find some way to display your work, whether it's on a trifold. A lot of people just do digital now and let people use things like tablets to view their work. 
Um, but you put some kind of presentation together that folks in the conference space can pop over to your table, spend five to 10 minutes there and uh, talking to you and interacting with your materials and, and getting to know about what it is that you've done. Um, you can see that there's also uh, uh, this section for competitions too. So there's going to be different kinds of uh, presentation options. And these competitions are a good way to, to start to take part in these things and get some stuff onto your CV if you're you know, not super uh, uh, maybe uh, experienced at this so far. Um, it's a little bit lower stakes. Um, I've done a three-minute thesis competition before in which I had to condense my entire master's thesis into a three-minute speech. And um, it was very, very challenging, very, very hard to do, uh, but a lot of fun too. And it made me think about my work differently as well. So maybe the only other thing to look at here would be along with your paper. If you want to do some kind of exhibit, you would probably want to fill out an exhibit application. Um, again, these cost money. Um, I'm not super familiar with Japanese currency, so I don't know what these uh, prices would be in, you know, USD. Um, but they give you just some, you know, different kinds of presentation types that they're looking for. And that can help you when you're in that step between finishing up your paper, submitting your paper, and then figuring out how you want to present it. So once you've got your call for papers, you can start to think about the direction of the revision of your paper because you've got your audience at that point. So uh, you should be able to have a good feel for what kinds of sources you might need. So we're going to talk about some different ways of getting information from your sources today. Um, obviously, it, I'm assuming most of you start with Google Scholar, which is why I have this open here. But the thing I'm really going to encourage you to do is to get to know how to use Northeastern's databases if you haven't already. So um, the reason I would advocate for that is because a lot of a lot of students, I think, overlook this aspect of things. But um, this is a big part of what you are paying for here at the university um, access to this information. You have 527 databases here. And once you graduate, if you were to want to maintain membership in all 527 of these databases, um, you would find yourself spending uh, probably thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to do this because memberships are, are usually between a hundred and a couple hundred dollars per year, depending on what journal it is. So you pay for this first. And, and second of all, you're getting access to information that, that most of the rest of the world doesn't have. Um, and that has massive value. And, and especially if you can figure out what you need uh, for future work you want to do while you're at the school, because, you know, you can download the papers that you need and have them for reference later on. Um, the databases here are listed alphabetically. And we're going to go into one and do some searches, but first we're going to look at this uh, uh, library guide from the MIT library on uh, uh, just different kinds of ser uh, search techniques that might help you. You can use these on Google Scholar. You can use them on the databases from Northeastern. It's entirely up to you, but we're going to start here with Boolean operators. Many of you probably already know about Boolean operators, but basically the way that you structure your search linguistically um, will control what results you get back. They give you three basics here, and, or, and not. So using and, uh, it will narrow your results. It will tell the database that all search terms must be present in the resulting records. So example, cloning and humans and ethics. If you put all of those things together, then you're going to get this area in the middle here, stuff that, that deals with the overlap of these three topics. Here it gives you some specifications which, you know, are uh, uh, good to know. So Google automatically puts the and between your search terms. So that's something to consider when you're, you're uh, searching on Google that there are ways you can search on other uh, uh, information aggregators that, uh, you know, 
uh, you would get different results than what you would get from from Google. So when you use or, you're connecting similar concepts or words. You're broadening your results. You're telling the database that any of your search terms can be present. So here we would only get the overlapping information. Here we're going to get it all. And lastly, you can you know exclude things. So the example here, you know, if you're researching cloning, you're probably going to get a lot of hits about sheep. And let's say that you are not interested in researching how to clone a sheep you want to think about how to clone other things so if you search for cloning not sheep then you'll get uh, results that don't have to do with cloning sheep um, it also says databases follow commands you type in and return results based on those commands be aware of the logical order in which the words are connected when using Boolean operators. Databases usually recognize AND as the primary operator and will connect concepts with AND together first. If you are, common, if you are using a combination of AND and OR operators in a search, enclose the words uh, uh, to be ORed together in parentheses. So, so you can see the examples down here. You can make different constraints for your search based on how you use the parentheses and your Boolean operators. Keep in mind that anything that you put in a complete, uh, in, in quotes, it'll search for the complete phrase that you're looking for and will only turn up results that contain that complete phrase in the order that it's in. So that's really good for if you, like I, I you know, write about literature. So if I wanted to find uh, and reference a particular, uh, let's say, line from a poem, but I can't remember the name of the poem, but I remember the line, and putting it all in quotes is going to turn up pretty much only that one result. They also have uh, uh, rules here for truncation, so root words that have multiple endings, words that are spelled differently but mean the same thing, and then tri uh, truncation wildcard symbols vary by database. So you really got to get to know the particular databases that you like to use and what their rules are. So here, um, truncating, also called stemming, is a technique that broadens your search to include various word endings and spellings. So enter the root of a word and put the truncation symbol at the end, whatever that database's truncation symbol is. Here, it's the asterisk. So if you use genetic with an asterisk, then genetic, genetics, genetically at all, uh, or I should say, etc. at all is only for people. Um, will turn up in your searches. And then similar to truncation, wildcards substitute a symbol for one letter of the word. So in this case, if you are looking for, like they have here, multiple spellings, or here, you know, you can see why searching for either woman or women at the same time would give you broader results, then, you know, you can use whatever their uh, uh, wildcard substitutes are for that particular database. So here they do some work on uh, 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 helping you differentiate between keywords and subject headings. So how you're searching will depend really on, on uh, what you're trying to find. So you might have a pretty well-developed idea about what you're searching for. And you might want to use subject headings because you're looking for something quite specific. But to start off, you should be using keywords because the keywords are going to give you kind of the broadest results related to that particular term that you're searching for. So it gives you some ways to uh, uh, compare the, the two usages. And down here you see the main takeaway. Keywords may yield many irrelevant results and subjects are usually relevant to the topic. But I think you want to work from keywords to subjects as through research you get a clearer idea of what it is that you are trying to find. There's also different ways that you can uh, constrain your search based on these uh, different search fields. This isn't research fields. These are search fields. You can look for a specific author. You can search by title. You can look for a specific journal. You can search text from an abstract. Maybe you have the abstract, but you don't have the paper. That might be a good way of finding the paper. You can look at the publisher, date, and then subject descriptor. And just like in any other, you know, uh, a search engine that you're using, once you start to use these uh, field specifications, you don't have to use them all. You can pick and choose which ones you want to use. So maybe you want to look for uh, uh, papers by an author in a particular journal published between one date and another date. This is a great way to do that.
So once you've figured out how it is that you can search through these databases, you probably want to figure out which databases are going to be best for your subject area. So let's pop into this one right here, engineering and computer science. And this is important because it's going to narrow down your searches from 527 databases to just 64, which is much, much, much more uh, 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 manageable. And you can see here that the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, this is one we already looked at. We looked at it through the web, uh, but you can access it here as well. So this is what the journals page looks like. Um, here you got your search bar, all content, all proceedings. Again, this is a more conference-based uh, organization, it seems. You can look at their uh, uh I would not say that this 1996 conference is one of the latest, uh, but you could look at some of these 2023 conferences to see, you know, what it is that they're up to most recently. But I think it would be good for our purposes to look at a database that is maybe uh, uh, more traditional in terms of online uh, publication. So here you have, again, it's the ASME, uh, but this is their journal program here. So again, you can find calls for papers here. Uh, the ASME, not very active on Twitter. Um, and then you can look at the different journals that you have. So this is where things get a little uh, hairy for me because I don't necessarily know, um, for instance, what applied mechanics is. Um, we talked about the Journal of Autonomous Vehicle uh, Vehicles and Systems already. Um, there's biomechanical engineering. Maybe I can come up with some kind of a cogent search in biomechanical engineering. But now you see this is how you know far down we've leveled from potentially 257 databases to 60, 57, 64, a much smaller number of databases. And then from there, this particular database, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and then from there, their journal that's specifically on bio. Uh, mechanical engineering. So let's say I want to look for something that's about biomechanics and athletic training. Let's run that search and see what I get back. So here we've got 118 search results, so uh, not too bad. Uh, footwear and elevated heel influence on the barbell back squat a review, a comparison of squat depth and sex on knee kinematics and muscle activation, um, design considerations for the attenuation of translational and rotational accelerations in American football helmets. This one seems pretty interesting, and I imagine part of the reason why this paper exists uh, might have something to do with what's happening in football vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, concussions and CTE. So let's see. Participants in American football experience repetitive head impacts that induce negative changes in neurocognitive function over the course of a single season. This study aimed to quantify the transfer function connecting the force input to the measured output acceleration of the helmet system to provide a comparison of the impact attenuation in various modern American football helmets. So this is exactly what I thought it was. And if this is something that I'm interested in, contact sports, CTE, maybe particularly American football, um, then this is probably a paper that I would at least want to kind of save in my bookmarks or download so I can reference it later, read it in more detail, and figure out if it's something I want to use in my own work. But that's basically the workflow, right? You start off by figuring out, hey, what's my topic and field area for this particular research? You can do different kinds of databases if you want to specify what kind, if you're just looking for data and statistics, for instance. If you're just looking for uh, uh, definitions of terms, you could do that. Um, and then for, from there, you want to choose a database that you think will work for you. Once you're in that database, you want to choose a journal that you think will work for you. And then search that journal and see what you can come up with. So the last thing I want to cover here is probably the most overlooked aspect of research amongst college undergrads. And this is the fact that your library is staffed with people who are research and information experts. 
Um, these people probably have uh, uh, some kind of degree in information science or library science, and their expertise is research itself. So anytime that you're starting a project, it's a good idea to look through this library staff directory and figure out, hey, who's the best librarian at the library for my particular field area? So as we scroll through the uh, uh, options here, you can see some of the, the options at the beginning are, are kind of a little more uh, uh, general. Uh, but as we continue to scroll here, um, we get Jody's profile here. Jody is an engineering librarian. And if we click on Jody's link here, uh, we'll get her email address, her phone number. That's her phone number at Northeastern, so you can call her. Um, and also, she's produced some research guides here that you could look to as well. So before you even get to, hey, maybe I want to have a conversation with Jody, you can look through some of the different materials that Jody has put together to help you research in certain field areas. And then if you're still not quite finding what you need, reach out to Jody. That's her entire job. She's the engineering librarian. So if you need help with engineering research, Jody is the one for you. She's not the only field area specific librarian um, at this particular uh, uh, school that you might want help from. So maybe if you are doing something in bi biomechanical engineering, um, uh, Philip might be able to help you, the health sciences librarian. We also have Alan, who's a STEM librarian. And that could possibly be use, uh, useful to you all. And then Catherine, who's a sciences librarian. Let's say that you're trying to put together something in a particular field area, but what you really need help with is digging through some data that you've collected and figuring out how to make that data come across to your audience in a visual way. You would want to get in touch with Kate. She can help you put together some great charts and graphs for your paper. And if we were to continue scrolling through this directory, we would find a number of other individuals on campus who are on campus specifically to help you with your research in your particular field area or the way that you want to work with the information that you've collected while doing research. Um, so don't overlook these folks. Once you have gotten a good feel for what's available to you in the databases, given the kinds of searches that you know how to do, uh, probably a good next step is to just get in touch with somebody from the library and say, hey, I'm working on this thing. What can you do for me? And you might be surprised at what that turns up.